This is Ribblehead among the lonely Pennine Hills, and the Cumbrian Mountain Express is climbing an incline that railwomen call the Long Jack. This is no ordinary railway, but a route that is perhaps the most scenic and spectacular main line in Britain, the Settle and Carlisle. Like many human endeavours, the Settle and Carlisle line was born out of a long frustrated need. By 1870, the expanding Midland Railway Company was anxious to secure a central route to the border to get a share of the lucrative Scottish traffic, and the problem was tackled by two Victorian visionaries with a flair for grand schemes, Engineer-in-Chief John Crossley and Midland's General Manager James Allport. Their plan was for a 72-mile route from Settle to Carlisle by the Ribble and Eden Valleys, through the limestone of the Yorkshire Hills by Penny Ghent and the table mountains of Ingleborough and Wild Boar Fell, across the Great Pennine Fault to the red sandstone of the Vale of Eden. The result was the most impressive piece of mainline construction through mountain country in Britain. 6,000 men completed the line in six years by spanning valleys with stupendous viaducts and piercing mountain heights with enormous tunnels making an ascent of more than a thousand feet above the sea by an incline easy enough for the swiftest passenger expresses and for the heaviest mineral trains. The workers lived in shanty towns built on the moors, grandly named Sebastopol, Jericho, Jerusalem and Salt Lake City. It is the generations of railway men and women that have given the line its special character. The train crews, the signalmen, the plate layers, the station staff, people like leading porter Monica Potter, who has given years of service to the railway traveller. She worked in the signal box at Horton in Ribblesdale before taking over platform duties at Settle. It was the return of steam to the Settle and Carlisle which captured the imagination of railway enthusiasts. British Rail introduced the Cumbrian Mountain Express, steam excursions using preserved express locomotives from all over the national railway system. The combination of steam hauled trains and the scenic grandeur of the Midland Main Line is an irresistible attraction for the railway traveller. The 45-year-old former LNER A4 Pacific Sir Nigel Gresley had worked the line in the last days of steam. A steam veteran from the old LMS days, Inspector George Gordon's memories go back half a lifetime. Well, my memories of the Carlisle Settle line go, obviously go back to the days when I was a fireman and the first trip I had. And uh, on that occasion, it was Whitmonda, 1937. And the only means of transport in those days for people was the, the British Rail, well, the railways at that time. And as you know, on uh, Whitmonda at Appleby, it's Appleby Fair, and uh, there's a considerable number of people came even as far as where as Bradford. So it was our job to take them back to Bradford on that day. And my, my first trip as a fireman meant that I was pit me skill against the locomotive to try and get up that incline to 1,169 feet above sea level. It was obviously a, a difficult project at that stage, first time up, strange driver, and of course, to reach that summit is something that everyone really wants to achieve as a fireman. And I'll say, on that day, I must have been half a scar against friend because I shoveled more coal than was necessary 
not obviously, a lack of experience. And uh, the result was I reached the summit and I was really chuffed about it because I was, I'd managed to maintain steam pressure and a good wa water level. And uh, that was my first day of the Carlisle Settler Line. In the days before grouping, eight railway companies worked in and out of Citadel Station at Carlisle, and the Midland Railway was the last company to arrive in 1876. Intercompany rivalries existed until post-war days. The old London and Northwestern route to Euston was advertised as the premier line, but the Midlands styled its main line simply as the best way. At Armouthwaite, the line starts its long ascent in the peace and tranquility of the Eden Valley, with views of the Lake District Mountains to the west and the giant slopes of the Pennines to the east. Local opinion was that no railway was possible here, but the Midland engineers raised a huge viaduct south of the station and immediately pierced a red sandstone hill with the first of 14 tunnels. The narrow Eden Gorge could only be negotiated by climbing along a precipice 150 feet above the river through the heavily timbered barren wood. The builders couldn't go round the sandstone hills in their way, so they just went through them with two more tunnels within a mile. The line crosses the river for the first time by the majestic viaduct at Eden Lacey and the toils of the Eden Gorge are left behind. In charge of the signal box controlling the level crossing at Culgaith, Alan Dugdale started on the railway as a junior porter straight from school. Of course, it's fantastic today the amount of interest there is in the uh, steam trains. But when I started 40 years ago at Lazenby Station, of course, there were all steam trains then. And the majority of the trains were just carrying about 25 wagons on account of the gradients up at Kirby Stephen and Malastang and through there. But it was fantastic, the, uh, the number of people in them days that travelled down the Midland line just for the scenic beauty of the, of the Hall line. It was 
I think it was one pound and three p from Lazenby to Leeds. And it was surprising the number that went from Leeds to, uh, to Lazenby in reverse for that one pound and three, just for the scenery alone, not, to, not for, for anything else, not to visit relatives or anything. And of course, at that time, Lazenby was a real thriving station. There was the station master, there was the chief clerk, there was a cattle dock man, there was two porters, and of course, I was the youngest member of the, tri of the, uh, of the tribe, just 15 years old then. And at a grand old wage of 16 shillings a week. Appleby in Westmoreland was once an important junction on the Settle and Carlisle. They rang the church bells here when the Midlands bill for the construction of the line passed through Parliament. The station is sited high above the town and in its heyday handled a great deal of agricultural and dairy traffic. A few miles south of Appleby, lying in the shadow of Wild Boar Fell, is Pendragon Castle, said to have been built by King Arthur's father. It is at this point, coming out of Burkett Tunnel, that the line starts to climb along the flanks of the fell, past Malastang Common. For the railway must aim for the only gap in the hills the Midland builders could use, the lonely A's Gill Moor. The steam locomotive tackling a climb with a heavy load is a personification of power which diesel or electric traction can never match. The distinctive beat of Sir Nigel Gresler's exhaust as the engine heads for the summit is music to the ears of lovers of steam. On the Cumbria-Yorkshire border, the highest point of the line is reached, Aeskill Summit, 1,169 feet above sea level. must maintain this elevation for another 10 miles and this proved to be the most difficult section of the route to build with a rapid succession of high fells, peat moors and deep valleys to negotiate through one of the wildest and loneliest parts of Yorkshire. Below the five arches of Lund's viaduct lies the quarry from which a great number of the viaducts and bridges were built. Through Moorcock Tunnel, the line reaches the head of two Yorkshire valleys, Garsdale and Wensleydale, crossing the 12-arch Dandry Meyer viaduct, which was built out of desperation. An embankment here was originally planned, but the land proved too boggy to support one. At Garsdale Station, Sir Nigel Gresley stops to quench his 5,000 gallon thirst. In the days of steam, Garsdale boasted the highest water troughs in the world. Formerly known as Hawes Junction, this railway community was built in the hills to serve the branch line to Hawes, and once had a turntable so exposed that the fierce winds sent an engine spinning. 
The engines that haul the steam specials on the long drag are superb examples of express locomotives from the heyday of steam, meticulously maintained in their original company liveries. Julian Riddick is chairman of the A4 Locomotive Society. The Sutherland Carlisle Railway. I think it takes me back to when I first went to live in Yorkshire in 1948. And I remember having a lovely day out on by train to Appleby. Uh, and it was in 1965, when I was just about to leave Yorkshire, that uh, the opportunity came along to buy 449 Nets and Nigel Grezzi. Um, unfortunately, at that very moment, I was moving down south. But then, of course, uh, we eventually decided to put it through the works uh, and have it overhauled properly. And ever since 1967, we have had the privilege and the great uh, fun of running on VR main lines all over the place in different places, even after the steam ban. Uh, and I think from then onwards, of course, we began to realize that we were in the leisure business, which is great fun because I think the leisure business is very important in this country. We have many, many overseas visitors we've had on the trains we've run. Uh, we have to take this locomotive out of service and we've got to spend a vast sum of money, £30,000 or thereabouts, on having the boiler completely retubed. And this is a very big, expensive business, which, thank goodness, doesn't happen too often, but when it does happen, you're faced with the process of trying to find the money. From Rise Hill Tunnel, one of the longest on the line, the railway takes another dramatic course, clinging precariously to the hillside above Dent Dale. The station at Dent is the highest mainline station in the land and the most prone to blockage by winter snow. At 1,100 feet, railway passengers enjoy a bird's eye view of the vale below, and immediately ahead are the magnificent Arton Gill and Dent Head viaducts, hewn from the rocks of the valley, known locally as Dent Marble. Lee Moor is the most inhospitable place between Carlisle and Settle. Wild country as empty today as it was a century ago. With a signal box so remote, no road leads to it. Buffeted by winds strong enough to lean into, which can blow for days. The men who keep a lonely vigil here rely on the tea time goods strain from Appleby to supply their drinking water.
highlight of the journey from Carlisle to Settle is the crossing of Ribblehead Viaduct. A quarter of a mile long, its 24 arches stand 100 feet above the moor. It is the most exposed structure on the line. On wintry nights, men were employed on gale duty to tighten wagon tarpaulins before good strains made the crossing. A lonely whistle in the wind recalls a multitude of memories for devotees of this railway in the hills. For the Settle and Carlisle line is an impressive tribute to our national railway heritage. It was conceived by men of imagination who possessed supreme confidence in the technology of their age. The railway bishop, the late Dr. Eric Tracy, maintained that the three chief wonders of northern England were York Minster, the Roman Wall, and the Settle to Carlisle Railway. The bold viaducts and tunnels stand as monuments to Victorian railway engineering, and the people who have worked the line over the past hundred years have assured this remarkable route a permanent place in British railway history.